It's October the 22nd, 2022, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. And we're back with another episode. Adrian is on the road. He's on a photo walk right now, but Jeremiah Crazy. is here. He's taking pictures. He's, like, he's doing... He's, the man what, is insane. It's, that is, yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was so shocked when I heard that. No, I think he's having a lot of fun. He's out there. He's taking pictures and we are, well, we are left to our own devices and we'll nerd out about things, about... Um, yeah. You'll Three notice topics. how rosy I am because my, my screen here is like completely <laughs> <laughs> very fuchsia red. I think I'll leave it alone. Or I can go no, don't worry totally about it. black and white. Don't uh, worry. You're dark. also kind of tiny in the frame and very low down. But okay, that doesn't really matter. I think most people are yeah, I'm listening to today. this anyway. I, I'm just exhausted. So People it's people are listening mostly. Um, anyway, so whoever's viewing this, there might be some interesting tidbits for you you can find this on youtube of course um Little yeah three things that we want to nerd out a bit about the first one is uh oh, the first thing is head size so like i want to head match size do you have a zoom size. do you have a zoom yes, function of course there? i do <laughs> Oh, there we go. Look at that. There we go. Oh, well, I'm bigger now. Now you're bigger. I won't, I won't do that. <laughs> um, the first, the first one I want to talk about is uh, is <laughs> lenses and their and their shape, especially about the, their thickness. So, um, let's kick this off with meta lens. It's a piece of news that just recently came across my uh, my inbox somehow, um, and it's. A company that has built flat lenses, and they've done it for a while, and they've just they've just secured a thirty million dollar funding round, which is significant. So, um, I was looking into that whole topic of flat lenses. I mean, we know how lenses work; they are pieces of slabs of glass, and then you need several of them, so you have a whole stack of glass, like eight, twelve, sixteen of them. So lenses are heavy. And what uh, what this this flat lens thing prom or wants to promise is that um, it's just one thin wafer of something, and that creates an image. And uh, the the technology has sort of worked in the lab. Um, what we're talking about is nanostructures on a transparent medium. Um, you you kind of etch that into like like you're making computer chips. You etch that into some substrate and. Uh, those nanostructures are so small they are at the, at the relative size of a wavelengths of light so they can also influence light and what comes out is a picture on a flat could lens. Could you imagine could you imagine uh, very high quality glassless lenses? Oh well this well we, we, I think we're, we're slowly getting there now what they do is um, they in the past it always looked like that stuff works but only in the lab and only at very specific wavelengths we're talking like infrared or something that is not very useful mm -hmm. to us um, now meta, meta lens is a company that has has done that stuff for a while there was a, a release I'm not sure if by them or maybe from a lab of some university but they actually went into color images um like full color and of course heavy ai usage there so what comes out is not a picture that you could recognize but you could um you could take a some some neural network and digest it through a neural network and that spits out a, a real photo of whatever weird patterns sure. it sees there um now it looks like uh, these guys metal lens are in business uh, not in your consumer camera not in your professional camera but um, we're talking more on a on a on a on an industrial uh, scale and base, because a company named ST Microelectronics, which you might not ever have heard of, but there's a good chance that a lot of devices you have have uh, stuff from them uh, in there. Um, the, these guys have bought millions of flat lens cameras from uh, from metal lens, and the way the way they want to use them is in 3D sensing. You know, like like there's there's depth cameras now sure, in, in sure. mobiles, there's uh, uh, what's it called? Apple's Face ID um, that does a 3D thing of your face with very, very involved technology. And uh, Medellin's claims that they can do this at half the price and half the thickness. 
So you know, I, I think we talked about this, you know, way back when, you know, a uh, hundred episodes ago. Who knows? Um, we talked about um, future prospects mm -hmm. of image capture, and and we did talk about. Uh, I remember having a conversation about, like, how do you capture... This, I think, was when LiDAR uh, had first popped yes. into the iPhone. And, and you know, thinking about how to capture um, image images or subjects um, completely digitally without any glass, just recording all aspects, recording right. the color, recording the depth, recording the shape, not unlike how... Diffusion models work, but this would be processed in, in camera. So effectively, you'd have a diffusion model in your actual device, which would then interpolate what it is sensing on different sensors, etc., depth, color, form, shape, and reimagine it in the kind of learning curve of like, that's a car, that's a red car, that is a car that is, you know, four feet wide, and and then create a, an image that is so sharp and so crisp that no lens can compete with that hmm. in terms of quality. I could see that. Another thing that I that I see here is that new technologies don't always arrive with a bang. They don't always arrive with a big fanfare, but they just sneak into your devices somehow and enable new functionality. So we're, we're talking about making them thinner, lighter, and in some ways maybe better. And, uh, and, and sometimes you will only find out later that there is something spectacular in there that you didn't know about and that, that the company didn't brag about, but yeah. that is available. So MetaLens might be one of those things is this is this the equivalent of like pharmaceutical companies who are developing a drug say for diabetes and come up with viagra possibly possibly you know, <laughs> or whatever they were looking for <laughs> so um yes the law of unintended consequences which we discuss often and uh, the kind of accidental forking of research is always fabulous and also for creative people like You know, um, like those of us who explore and, and follow our accidents uh, along a path and that reveal uh, greater opportunities, even from our original intention, always fun. Yep. So a uh, second thing on the list here is something that has been around for, uh, I don't know, a, a few years now. Um, but I just recently really started to understand what is so spectacular about them. I'm talking about nerves, neural radiance fields. And uh, the reason I kind of understood them a bit more was that uh, I watched a video, we're going to link that in the show notes, where someone explains things in detail. Now, the, it also goes into some mathematical formula where I, where I, turn, I switch off my brain, but, but it, a general, a better understanding. So first of all, what are nerves? Nerves are um, 3D representations of a scene that you, um, that you cr well, let's put it this way. You put, you, you throw a few pictures into Uh, into a training network. Like you take pictures from different orientations of something and then you give that to a machine that makes a nerve, a neural radiance field out of those. And that nerve is pretty much a neural network that uh, will give you a 3D representation of that scene. So you can yeah. hover over it, you can, you can circle around things, you can move around in that 3D environment and... Uh, Uh, and it and it it looks like something that we've seen before, as in yeah, you have it on your phone. There you go. I do. Um, <laughs> I just as of yesterday. Yes. Uh, they just allowed me into the beta. Yeah. So I haven't tested it yet. That's how new it is. So so uh, we we've had these things, right? You have we've had 3D on computers a long time. Uh, and the traditional way of making that was um, that you'd have to have a system that has coordinates and then you'd have uh, vertices in different spots on in the in the space you'd have 
triangles, you have texture on those triangles, you'd have uh, surfaces and faces and stuff, and and uh, you'd, you'd have to be very explicit of what goes where, and you, it's pretty much a construction um, map of that 3D space, and that takes up a lot of space and uh, takes a while to make, and there's another method to get there is called photogrammetry, where you take pictures yes. of, uh, of something from different angles, and then that takes those pictures and finds out what the 3D geometry behind it is and then creates that explicit 3D map that I just talked about. Yeah, so, not, not only does it take the geometry, but it takes the the reflectivity. The colors, the reflectivity and so on. Uh, all of those, it processes them, and that is how you have uh, Adobe Substance and there's a whole litany. Right, but now okay. nerves. Nerves <clears throat> are different from that because a nerve is a neural network. And if you look at if you look at neural networks for like let's say stable diffusion or DALI, um, those are one big network that has everything in it, right? So you can you can ask it to spit yeah. out a tomato with a green hat, but a nerve is pretty much it's it's different from that because it, it's a neural net for one scene. So you have one neural net that has one scene in it, and what you can ask this neural network is um, you tell it where you want to look at and it returns to you the color and everything and the, the reflectivity and the transparency of that point you want to look at. And if you ask it for many points, you have an image. And these nerves are, first of all, really fast. And the second thing, and that's what I just understood, is this whole... And, and it has all the depth and all the information that you want. But the really revolutionary thing is the size of them. A nerve is a, a mere fraction of what that same 3D thing in traditional 3D would be. We're talking many gigabytes versus a few megabytes. And, and, and also, because it's limited in scope, one could see the opportunity to develop apps for um, you know smaller devices. Sure. Where in I mean we see it now just in terms of diffusion models where you can go. Uh, I would like to purchase a diffusion model of all flowers mm -hmm. on the planet, past, present, and even future imagined <laughs> in terms of breeding. So every flower will be there, and f and if you want to then use a diffusion model specifically for flowers, the accuracy should be absolutely pinpoint, razor sharp, photorealist, if that's what you want, then you can apply it from within, handshake in terms of server, to elect for style differentials, because you don't have to keep all those styles on your device. But I can really see the, that combination of specificity um, 3D elements, substance creation, or texture creation, or reflectivity creation, um, and all of this basically in your pocket. Uh, th this is, uh, <laughs> by the way, this is really about the future of photography. I mean, as far as working with this, one hundred percent yes, absolutely one hundred percent yes. These these nerves are, and and it's and it's an area of uh, research that is that has exploded over the last years. I've just uh, recently tried to get an overview of what is going on there. And we're talking hundreds and hundreds of different research papers um, yeah. that, that explore and expand this in different areas. And yes, you can now get those on your phone and they will be the basis of many, many applications in the future. Very, oh, very sure. much. Well, um, even, even, even the, even things like a metaverse and stuff like that will base, be based on nerves because the nerves are so powerful. Yeah, the problem uh, that we face in in kind of the hope for the metaverse, however you define it, is if you want photo real um, in terms of environment that are continually up updating, upgrading, and multiple um, avatars that are basically photo real, and you want to scale it, uh, I don't think we'll see that kind of computing power in our life. Uh, I, I think the global um, 
availability of that kind of quick processing power. Now, if you then combine a certain amount locally and a certain amount on the server and have that as as being a good handshake, I think then you can approach it. And I think that that explains a lot why um, the the uptick on on uh, metaverse use is you know minimal now. I mean, you you, you see these uh, arenas that have 30, 40, 50 people at any one time. It, a, it's lack of imagination or trying to create what exists. B, who cares about that? We yep. have it in real life. Um, we also uh, are going to be subject, you know, subjected to um, Zuckerberg's kind of Basically, that the metaverse is a complete advertising. I think uh, walk it's. In the park. I think it suffers from a branding issue because of the company that it comes from. So probably, I think yeah. that's. That, I think that's one of the biggest issues because kids don't go there. And no, but the promises are also. They're making promises they can't keep. Yeah. Ba basically, yes. Um, I mean, I, I for one would think of. You know. A, a 3D Zoom meeting where I I just felt I was in a room in yeah. real time, no lie. I mean, that's the goal, people. kind. That's kind of the goal, isn't it? To be, to sit at a table with other people that are there Distant. while they're not yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. But but again, I I, th I think just seeing how things have snuck in from the from the open source side, uh, as in stable diffusion, sure, and uh, especially the things that they have planned, including video and so on. Uh, we and are 3D. And 3D, 3D, we are probably going to see some iteration of it, iterations yeah. of soon, that soon. Uh, in in, in that yeah. in that virtual field. Okay. I think in the next year, don't you think? Oh, oh, very likely, very likely. This yeah. is a field that is moving forward so fast; it is mind-boggling yeah. to see. Um, speaking of mind-boggling, um, you are a filmmaker. You are. Um, so they say. So they say, and you. Uh, you use tools to edit video, to cut video, and uh, you also work with special effects people. And uh, some of those things are like remove the re swap out the background for something, or uh, yes. give, give them an alpha mat so I can tr make something transparent, or yeah. uh, track, to, track to motion here to to put in some I don't know, sure. put a mustache on someone. You need m a motion tracking for that. To clean up bags. On certain nitruses, maybe. Uh, yeah. The, the the, and I, probably um, am one of those directors who was in a transitional period. I cut my first movie on a moviola. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Upright moviola. I then went to a Steenbeck flatbed, uh, and then graduated to um, Lucas, a large disc. Right, nonlinear editing, and that, or first we did tape editing offline, online, then we went to discs, then we went to complete digital. So I've I've been through the litany on editing tools from the you know I, I didn't do what Robert Wise did when he <laughs> cut Citizen Kane, uh, which is just hold out with a razor blade the, and yeah <laughs> they would just measure they'd go like this is about twenty four frames so that's about a second second yeah. and a half two and a half. He explained this to me one day. I had the opportunity of spending that some time with him. It's a huge level of ab abstraction you have to make and still have it work. And it all was beautiful, all yeah. the cutting the pattern rhythms. Um, so, and then, and this, this is a good intro to where we're going, uh, I was asked by, I think, USC uh, Film School or whatnot. They, they did a, a, a lecture with... Um, three directors, three editors who had made the transition from linear to digital right. and how it affected the workflow, how it affected their interaction with the studio, et cetera. And all of us agreed, we, we had all kind of cut with an editor on film and then we, we moved to digital and we cut with digital. What was the difference? And the difference uh, that we all shared was that the opportunities of using digital and in kind of projecting forward neural networks and AI assists, which we'll get into in a moment, um, allowed us to explore so many more uh, approaches to cutting a scene. Whereas before, we would make a decision, I would give notes, 
The editor would start to assemble. I'd walk around the block or go home, visit the next day, have a lot of thinking time about it, come back with that point of view, react, and move forward. We would have 30 weeks to cut a movie, so it was very <laughs> kind of safe. So when we moved to digital, we were all excited. Oh, look what you could do. We could try it this way. We could try it that way. Every which way, instantly. But the, again, the law of unintended consequences, we then had 16 weeks to cut a movie and yeah. now 12 weeks to cut a movie. So while the tools provide us with a lot of forking paths to explore, the commercial pressures of using those from the studios became an onslaught of time. So we, we lost in time and thinking and pondering and experiencing that moment of reflect reflection on what we were doing to the instant gratification of, of what was there. Was it better or worse in terms of filmmaking? It depends on the film. It depends on the director. I it, One cannot make that assumption. Some worked, some were yeah. not. But now we are moving into, take it away, Chris. Well, it, 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 I, I think, and, and you and I have, have something in common here. We've both seen different, very different uh, technological paradigms, and we have... Uh, both seen the analog world and the digital work uh, world and the transition between those. I think that is a very good thing to have under your belt because I've uh, I, I I get the sense that a lot of digital natives. Um, yes, how do, how do, the, the pondering, the philosophical, the the, 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 the think the thinking time is less today for sure. You right. just you just alluded yeah. to that. So so um and but one thing I see a lot when we're transi in this transition from analog to digital is that we're still keeping a lot of the analog paradigms with us. Like the linear editing is sort of mirrored in the in Adobe Premiere, for example. It looks a bit like a linear editor. You have tracks, you can cut things behind each other. Of course, you have now multiple tracks and everything is simpler and you can, uh, undo is a big thing, but... but uh, bins, look, bins, bins. Bins, yes. Paradigm, but paradigms, paradigms shift slowly, but now we are at the, at the verge of a big, big paradigm shift. And what we're looking at is, of course, AI getting into a lot of these things. Um, the, uh, many image editors have a, 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 a built-in, like, uh, subject. Uh, selecting a subject in Lightroom is now one click, and then you can modify that. But what we're looking at now is that whole uh, paradigm moving into video, and that is where I think it gets really exciting. And the one thing that I just re recently accidentally came across is Runway ML. Runway ML is a video editor, which in itself is not very exciting. Um, it runs in your web browser. That's a bit more exciting, right? Just have it wherever you have a web browser, wonderful, with your project. So it runs in the cloud somewhere. Uh, but then it, it massively uses machine learning, AI, in order to uh, complete tasks that you would normally take a lot of time for. I mean, let's let's just look at a few of those. I'm not, uh, I, I can't really demonstrate here, but we can look at some of them. Um, one thing that I guess you, Jeremiah, um, need for, for special effects a lot is background removal, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. here, what they, what they demonstrate is just click on a subject and the background goes away. The subject is extracted from that background. Um, I played with that function a bit. It works. It's not super exactly every strand of hair kind of thing. So if, if you need that uh, level of quality, um, I would expect this to come in a in a year from now, maybe. But yeah, I mean, on the you know on the um, the, the the kind of neural selection of backgrounds usually they come with tools for cleanup right or refine edges that and you can do thing. this here you can you can yeah. go in and and it's and it's tracked over the time of video clips so you have a moving person and that person can move around and uh, gets tracked um, so removing the background of a video is literally a one or two click operation and it is there instantly so it's it's not something you wait for uh, for it to render but it it's just it just happens so um that is built in there text to image of course 
stable diffusion under the hood for sure. Um, just put in, like, you, you need a nice background of something, let's say, like a nuclear power plant uh, control room. Um, you can have stable diffusion build one for you and then you put it in the background. So that is built in there. Um, image to image. How, how, how about turning that photo into a cartoon? Or how about um, using... How about turning a whole film into a cartoon? Yeah, yeah. And image to image is built about, in, right? How about turning a whole cartoon into a realistic looking photographed yes. story? Per perfectly feasible with this tool. Yes. Um, uh, erase and replace. Okay, just take a part of an image. I don't, I'm not sure this is for video. I think it, uh, there's is also still image related. And just replace it. Uh, example here is a, a old shabby f soccer ball replaced by a more modern one. Um, text. This to next one is 3D very texture. exciting. <laughs> so very text, exciting. text to three D texture is okay. You you have a three D object and you want to give it a texture. And normally you'd have to find that texture and apply it and so on. Uh, here you just type in what kind of a texture you want and it creates that and puts it on the object for you. So yeah, and and the 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 text to three D um, is is very very useful when you're building three D environments or sure. not. So if you you've kind of created um, a poly, you know poly, polygonal landscape and you go I want um, you know dry grasslands. You could just really type yeah. in dry grasslands, except refine and whatnot. Put it into your cube and then basically you you could refine the tiling of it. That's another conversation and then just apply it to your your yeah. image and you'll have grasslands within a few minutes that that is um that will that's wild I'm not, <laughs> yeah that's wild i mean it's basically um text to photogrammetry is, yeah. is what we're talking about all right then of course and uh, video also means audio and uh one of the things that ai can do pretty well now is remove background noise like uh, squirrels or a Science. squirrel in the background, a road in the background, <laughs> an ambulance, uh, of, uh, whatever, air conditioner or something. Um, that removal works pretty well, and that's something that most people will need for editing a video. Um, transcripts. There's another model that just recently was released into the open source called Whisper by OpenAI. <laughs> and uh, I think that's the first thing they released into the open source. And uh, it's really, really good at transcribing. So if you do any uh, social media content or any other content where you need uh, a caption under it, then that does it for you automatically with a click. So It will be very interesting um, to see how that works with uh, translation. Good um, translation and and, and uh, Whisper does that. I've played with Whisper. It does it only to English. So, but it's uh, Whisper speaks like fifty different languages or more, and uh, most of them quite well. I tried it with German. It reads or or transcribes German just fine, um, better than anything I've seen before, and it translates that into English like that. So, I just wanted you know, in the other direction. Yeah, for film, those who will not use the kind of yeah. <laughs> reanimating um, and voice ID yeah. that we've talked about in previous weeks, which is also very exciting. Right. Uh, in painting is another tool they have on board, which means you can now, on in video, just remove that lamppost that's in the way or something moving in the video. So again, it tracks very with the video. Very exciting for filmmakers. Definitely. Super exciting. You have something weird in the background uh, that would normally cost uh, some money for some special effects person to take care yeah. of. And this um, lets you do it with a click of the mouse. Yeah, uh, particularly useful when you're making a period film. You can't remove a billboard or a sign or a right. car in the background or whatnot. These things do cost a lot of money, and it's right. fabulous to have your editor do it, even um, on the fly, uh, knowing that you'll do a high-quality removal maybe later. Possibly. A, I mean, but, even if it's not at... If, even if it's not at the Hollywood level just yet, it is still good enough for you to easily sure. communicate an idea to someone um, much easier than just telling them. You can just show them, this is what I want, just in better, make it. And, and by the way, what, one of the things that, that excites me about um, AI in general, um, 
more than, say, a creative tool, is the conceptual tool. Right. In, in other words, I think uh, I just saw that somebody uh, was launching a company that is all about interior design uh, with neural networks. So you photograph your room, you upload it, and uh, you go, I'd like to see this furnished in, you know, mid-century modern, <laughs> you know, what does that look like? Boom! And, and you can play with that or 18th century. So, or architectural design or uh, something that I've played with, uh, stage design, you know, operatically to get something. And to show, well, this is the mood. This is the mood board. This is the kind of thing we'd want. And then, you know, humans can interact and build it out and be really, really um, uh, very, very precise about the inspiration that would be that man-machine um, relationship. Yeah. So um, let's just finish up. A, a couple more tools here that are background-related, like replacing a background, making green screen background. Those are pretty much the same things, uh, blurring a background. Uh, exporting an alpha mat, very helpful if you want to take that into a different tool that you are used to and um, um, that gives you transparency information. So you've put it, take, take it into Adobe Premiere or something and work there uh, with the transparency that this AI tool generated for you. Have you run into any tools that will create an accurate but changeable depth map? Um, I've never looked at these tools, so I'm, no, I haven't really seen yeah. any yet. I'm looking for one. Nurse, nurse will do that for you sooner than later. Yeah, but I mean, I'm not talking about from real, from an image. Yeah. Mm. From an image, create a depth map that I can adjust, sort of like bokeh. I think and those. I think the people who um, who turn movies into 3D, even old movies, they have sure, these they, tools. I think. Yeah, but they're not on my phone. Not really. No. <laughs> not on my computer. Um, so yeah. last last two things here on the list of tools is motion tracking, which, yeah, you might need to. Again, if you want to put a mustache on someone's face, you first need to track their motion. So that is a function. And the, the last one I found funny, text to color grade or text to LUT. So if you want a LUT uh, lookup table to give you a certain look, a certain visual style in terms of color and contrast and so on, <clears throat> then uh, you can just tell it what you want it, what you want it to be, and it makes it so. Uh, runway ML, I would say, and I'm sort of at the same, just starting to explore these kinds of things. But this is the equivalent of Photoshop One. Oh, we are we are just at the beginning. This is going to be. I mean, this yeah, this is the basics that they ca came out and released. I guess this month. Uh, where it will go is absolutely exciting, amazing. And again, editors will go, well, you don't need editors anymore. Well, of course you're going you need will. editors. In, in, in other words, the machine can only offer up suggestions as a machine, but you have to learn how to accept, deny, change, adjust, etc. That is that, you know, that relationship is the same relationship you would have with a brush, a paint, and yeah. the texture of a canvas. And it you runs in your browser. Yeah. <laughs> um, this, I mean, this, this is the, I, I think one of the real applications here at this point in time is the, either you use something like Runway ML to make your whole project, uh, or if you want to use it in a bigger professional field, then um, you use it as a conceptual tool as a tool yeah. to describe something, to show something to someone else that will then work on things. Though I'm, I, I am very curious, I've seen various iterations of that, of having GPT-3 write a script, short script, have uh, a diffusion model create the shots, have Runway ML edit it, and have one of these newer sound neural networks create the music and then up-res it and release it, that would be, if it was effective, it was gibberish? No, and most of it is gibberish or cheesy. It's slowly but, getting there. 
it's you know, getting it's, there. it's moving yeah. there. What we are seeing, I mean, you you have to, in some of those things, you still have to have the uh, the imagination to understand where it will be going. But uh, where, it we, won't, where it won't work, you, or where I it won't more, work, yes. I, th I think that's more like it. In other words, the expectation of an emotive response to all of these things created purely by machine right. is very elusive. Um, but if you can, if you can create the humanistic input that allows a emotional reaction, instinctive or not, that is where we'll get to a sweet spot, and we're far from that right now. Yeah. Anyway, th I think this is really exciting uh, to to have a look at these things, to play with them, to to explore, and to to uh, I think to develop a bit of a sense of what might be in the works, and then the get surprised again around the yeah. next corner, right? And then get yeah. surprised around the next corner again of what's sure. what's happening in the world. Anyway, that's the three things we wanted to talk about: uh, flat lenses, nerfs and runway ml and um we have come to the picks of the week i am just going to be lazy i want to pick runway ml because it's I something it's a good one. something yeah. worth playing with it's something worth having a closer look at um it, there's a free tier so you can uh, get like three projects and use some of the tools the most essential ones like background replacement and and so on um and then after three projects, you'll and if you want to use all the tools, you'll have to upgrade. And I think it's twelve bucks a month. So, for someone who's serious about these things, yes, then that's definitely worth uh, subscribing to for a while at least to see <laughs> what you're missing out on. Um, and you brought something also in the same realm uh, for photo editing. Um, this is a, um, a a newer version of of Skylum's. Uh, editor um, and is amazing. I mean, it, it, this is amazing. Again, you could transform a picture within 60 seconds that would have taken you several hours in Photoshop. Um, it is uh, using, again, uh, artificial intelligence for selection. You can select the face. Having selected the face, you then select the lips, the eye color, um, you could do this so quickly. Again, background removal, sky replacement, which they've done from the beginning. Skylum, very, very good. Uh, but this is, uh, this is an amazing editing tool for, uh, for photography and uh, well worth exploring. Uh, they make very, very good projects. Uh, they make amazing applications and they are a very responsive company. I like selecting a sky uh, in a picture is just one click. It'll give you, you can select water. You can just touch a button for water. It's amazingly accurate. So you can touch water, trees, mountains. You can combine them. So masking becomes very, very quick. And again, you can refine and adjust. So I do... You know, I, um, I encourage people to, to try this out. It's good. Um, it analyzes the, the image and it determines what's in that image. And then it makes decisions about what you are requesting within the image. Um, so there you go. All right. That... Looks exciting. That's, nerd, that's nerded out for the week. There we go. And uh, I think one thing one thing is clear. AI is seeping into every nook and cranny. We have... Uh, and, and, we're, and we're still very in very early yeah. days here. So there's... And the Luddites are on the rise. Oh, of course. They will. <laughs> they will. Railing against it. And yeah, but try, try to uninvent it. Good luck. It's not yeah, happening. Yeah. It's not yeah. happening. So um, I've decided to make the best out of it. I, anyway, I fully, I embrace it. I'm I, looking I forward think it's to it. Exciting. Changes. Well, that's why we're here. Future of photography. Anyway, thanks for joining. Thanks for being here. We'll be back soon with more. We will. Uh, we are at thefutureofphotography.com. See you then, everyone. Take care. And You've 
you've been listening to the future of photography subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com